Welcome to the Afterlife Files, where we investigate near-death experiences, shared death experiences, and how they affect you. Unlike podcasts that are just stories, we will give you a heads up on what to look for in our conversation. And then, after the interview, stick around. We'll help you make sense of those accounts so you can incorporate the insights into your life. I think you'll find that having your most profound questions answered Living life in the physical is filled with more peace and joy. Our special guest today is Bob Holbrook. He's Director of Innovation for the Monroe Institute and is an integral part of the team that is developing new technologies protocols, and research in order to create new ways to share the unique and positive benefits of audio-guided meditations with the world. Bob began his association with the Monroe Institute in 1994. He became a trainer in 1997 and has been the Institute's lead audio engineer for the last 11 years. We're very grateful for Bob traveling from Chicago to Virginia to be with us in the studio here today. As you watch this wonderful interview, Bob uses the phrase non-local awareness several times. What he means by this is the ability to have your consciousness be aware of or located in areas not in close proximity to your physical body. Out of body and remote viewing are common examples. Later, Bob does a very good job of explaining the different types of information you can get when experiencing either out-of-body or remote viewing. Here's our interview. Hi everyone and welcome to the Afterlife Files. You may notice that uh, we're in a different location. It's actually my studio but the camera's pointed in a different direction because today we're going to be talking about the tools of expanded awareness. And my guest, and we're very grateful to have him, is Bob Holbrook. Welcome, Bob. Hello, Scott. Glad to be here. <laughs> I'm glad you are here. <laughs> um, so, Bob, tell us a little bit about um, what the Monroe Institute is known for. Um, the Monroe Institute is known for consciousness exploration and particularly we use um, audio guided meditation to support that and it's, uh, it's a means of allowing people to reach very interesting and beneficial states of consciousness and expanding their consciousness in ways that might not ordinarily happen in day to day life and um, those are very useful and beneficial states that we've been in using, developing, experiencing, researching for many years. And um, it's a way to gain access to these very positive and beneficial states fairly quickly and very efficiently. And um, the Monroe Institute is, um, it got known for out-of-body experiences. You know, Bob Monroe wrote three books about it. Did you ever ch have a chance to meet Bob Monroe? I did. When I first came to the Monroe Institute, it was 1994, and he was present there, and I did meet him, and I had actually had some meals with him. And um, he was a fascinating man, and uh, I was there uh, for a program, the Gateway program, that the Monroe Institute pre uh, presents. It's a residential program, as you know, and um, he was very excited because there were so many younger people, and in those days I was a younger people, <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and he was very excited to see that all these younger people were getting, you know, there was a, a much wider range of age demographic in his group, and he was very pleased with that. And um, I don't know, he came and visited the program. He wasn't teaching or training the program, but he would come by very often, and he was clearly very excited and enthusiastic about the process that had developed, and then being present to see its, it, you know, its action and in, in being in application. Okay. Yeah. So in application, um, what kinds of things do people experience when they're in this expanded state of awareness? Mm -hmm. 
Well, there's several different things that happen. And I would say, first of all, everyone has the experience based on the context of their life mm. and their you know, ability to release and let go into the residential program process. But I would say that I have not, even though sometimes it might be a, a bit of a struggle for people, other people not so much, but at the end of the week-long program, everyone finds their lesson or, or a benefit to their life. And some of those benefits are within the course of one week, life-changing benefits. They're very extreme. Yeah. I like that idea that um, everybody brings their own history to the, mm -hmm. to the program. So uh, the benefits have to be seen within that context. That's right. That's right. And Bob Monroe, right from the beginning, and we maintain that as well, the Institute does not have, it's not really a discipline or a dogma or a magic recipe. It's a very careful way to hold space and, and give support to people as they go through the process in their own way. And Bob Monroe, he wrote several books and, and they were, the first one especially was his, his, his diary of his experiences. And it was intended by him to be a catalyst. This is how much I could experience. You go find out. But your experience might be different and probably will. So don't try to copy me. He didn't want to be a guru or the guy who had the way, but he was the guy who could show you what was possible. So what are the benefits that you have seen people gain in your years of training with the Institute? Well, I think in the beginning, as people first become involved, I think the first remarkable experience they have is realization of the level of stress they carry and they come to that realization as that stress is dissipated. It's like, wow, oh, uh, I can I, breathe easier. <laughs> I'm sleeping. I can't believe how well I sleep here. I'm laughing. I'm happy. I'm, you know, and that all happens with an entire group of people. And we have a fairly large reach. We have people from all over the world, all age groups. Um, you name it. The demographic is very wide. And by the, in the end of the week, it's a very well-bonded group that have shared experience and shared their, um, their personal growth with others. We have lots of discussions and we all learn from each other and they leave with a very positive you know, change or a direction for change in their life as they go home. When they leave the course, it doesn't end. That's just the beginning of you know, many, many things that can be of great value in your life. So give me some other kinds of valuable things that, that people take away. Well, uh, we have many different, we have many different programs with several different focuses. And one of the really unifying things we do is when you relax and you turn your attention inward, okay, we're going to let the busy outside world disappear. You're away from your home, you're away from your job. They cook beautiful meals for you. You don't have to, you know, work. You can spend some time with yourself, with others who are doing the same thing you are, and maybe not in the exact same way, and you turn inward. And from that inward um, attention, you can expand awareness within that. And then your awareness grows to a place where I like to use the term non-local awareness. And then many amazing things that you normally don't pay attention to or you have other you know, um, explanations for start to unfold in a way that is very rich, very useful, and very amazing. True. So how did you get involved with the Monroe Institute? <laughs> well, I was a over-the-top type A personality workaholic. What? You? Yeah. Can you believe it? <laughs> yeah. Um, and... Uh, I had finished a huge project, you know, and it was a real, uh, not so much stressful, but it was draining. And um, the production team said, you know, you go on a vacation. And so I had not read any of the Bob Monroe books. I did, had never heard of the Monroe Institute, but a friend suggested, well, if you're looking for a place to go on a vacation, you have to go here. She had been to the Monroe Institute and I trusted her and I thought, well, it's in the beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains. You lay around and meditate all day and they feed you. How hard could that be? So I went and I had no expectation, no understanding of what I was getting into. And within two days of 
the experiences and the people I was meeting, um, things I started becoming aware of my stress, my you know tight focus on life, you know success, 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 and uh, that started to release, and it felt really good. And so I kind of started to pursue that and um, had an amazing experience. And it changed my life in that one week. I went back to my job where I was very successful and very stressful. And I can remember I would be sitting in my office at my desk and people would walk by and, and what did they do to you? You know, <laughs> said, you're nice. You know? <laughs> and so, um, you know, there was reinforcement when I returned that something had happened that was very beneficial. Cool. So, um, as a trainer, you train all different kinds of programs. Give us kind of a flavor for what they are. Um, well, I train all of the, the original Monroe Institute programs. The original flagship program is guidelines. And what I think is so amazing about the Monroe Institute that I know you probably won't find anywhere else in a, you know, a consciousness research place or experience place. And that is, to this day, we're using the Gateway program as our introductory program, and it's relatively unchanged since its origin almost 50 years ago. And it was so beneficial then that it's evolved a little, but as our introductory program, it's remained the same, and it's just as you know, uh, effective now as it was then. Not many things can do that. Um, after you, you would probably enter the, uh, the program process there to learn the tools, the language, and, you know, the basics. Um, and by basics, I don't mean less than, you know, I mean Very good. the, be the yeah. beginning entry. And um, then from there, there are several places you can go. There's, there's a, uh, a program called Guidelines, which is about guidance and intuition and, you know, simple basic things like, can you, do you listen to your intuition? Do you trust it? And we all know that we don't. I mean, how many times have you said, I knew I should have done it. that. <laughs> and well, well, then why didn't you? You didn't trust it. And you learn that intuition and guidance from that can be extremely valuable. And then there's a lifeline program where we can talk to people who have transcended, um, people we know, people we don't know, um, and we can engage in, it. again, a non-local awareness that normally might come to you in a dream and you write it off as a dream but when you can go there with intention and you have contact and communication um, that's real because it's your experience no one is telling you a story or showing you a movie you are genuinely experiencing it and I've had that experience with people I've known and loved in my life and I know it's real you know and no one could tell me any different so you can have your own version of that experience um, we have uh, of course, an NDE program, you know, where again, non-local. Love it. Yes, right. And and so again, all these what we what we are good at is helping people facilitate non-local awareness, and we're really good. We actually have a research program which will begin next week here called the Discovery Program, and in that program, we have used techniques like out-of-body experience and remote viewing. Remote viewing is where you can say information or depict information about a target, a, a picked location, without any regard to time or distance. In other words, I can get, you can put a target, a picture of, say, um, a building in France. And I will, because you have an intention that that's the target, that highlights the target for me and my non-local awareness, and I can describe it. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if that house is hundred years ago, today, 3,000 years in the future, I will be able to see it and describe it. And not so much name it, but I can give you data about it. And so that's another thing. So in the discovery program, we have uh, participants do out of body and do, and they're trained how to do that and do remote viewing and they're trained how to do that. And then they have targets that none of the trainers know about. And if oh, so it's a it's a double blind. It's totally double blind. The targets are selected by people far away, and then they will sketch their impressions and make drawings and say, you know, I'm seeing red. I'm seeing it's man-made, and it's not so much that they'll name what the target is, but they'll be able to give you elemental data about it. 
then all those papers from the, we have like 16 to 20 participants in this program, all of their data goes to the people who selected the target, and then they see if they guessed it right based on guessed it, ascertained it. There we go. Better word. I yes, like that. Yes, sorry about that. Um, ascertained the, the, the target, and um, then we know that during the course of that, where we're monitoring their EEG and some other things, um, if they got the target correct, then we know they were in non-local awareness because we have the evidence because how else could they have gotten the target correct? Then we look at that brainwave pattern and we look at what is happening in the brain. And I would say carefully that the brain is not necessarily your consciousness. We look at it as an antenna or a, a connection to your infinite consciousness. And so if you perfect that antenna through the meditation techniques of the Monroe Institute, you can gain more access to your infinite consciousness, therefore become non-locally aware. So if they hit the target, we see those brain waves, we can reverse engineer and create things that, well, let's see if this makes it better. Oh, it did. And we found very, very sophisticated ways of using gamma synchrony that totally helps people enter non-local awareness. Last December, we did a remote viewing with a group of 12 people. Now remember, the target could be anything in the world. It's or anywhere in the world? Or anywhere. In fact, I always... Yeah, any time in the world. That's correct. And I tease the groups usually because I know that... Oh, I don't know. But I assume that the people selecting targets will be limited to planet Earth. And I'll say, we're going to do a remote viewing. And it could be anywhere in the world. I'm going to make it easy on you. It's not in the universe. It's in the world. But yeah, we have had people, Joe McMonagall has remote viewed Mars before a lot of the pictures were taken. And when some of the pictures were taken of Mars, they confirmed exactly what he had seen. So that was pretty interesting. So we can support non-local awareness really well. Let me just say one more amazing thing. Yeah, I'm sorry, but it, this is good. This is Okay, good. I'm, I'm ready. We're at the level now with our gamma synchrony. I have to be careful when I say this, but I'm just stating a fact. In our December program last year, we had 12 participants. They all remote viewed the target, which could be anything, and every single person hit the target. That's unheard of. That's unheard of. Yeah. Any remote viewing program. So, wow. So now those signals are great. So not only does it help you remote view, it helps you gain non-local awareness. And, and certainly so, confidence in what your, well, your ability is. You can repeat that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you let it slip that you monitor their brainwave patterns. Um, how do you do that? We use something called a mind mirror device and it, it puts six electrodes on your head, which takes a little while to do for 16 people, but we get everybody wired up and then uh, we have monitors that monitor the process of them going, listening to a Monroe audio exercise. And then each monitor will monitor on a split screen four people at a time. And so we're all doing it together, the same exercise. And I love to walk around the room because they don't all look the same. You know, they're all listening to the ex, but you can see the individuality is very remarkable. But then every once in a while on this device, it will show these very coherent patterns that come and I mean, they're geometrically coherent. And, but they don't last long and they go about 10 seconds or so and they're gone and now everybody's different. And then this person will go into a pattern, this one, they don't even go into the patterns at the same time. So we've kind of dubbed those and they're different types of patterns that we have specifically identified. And we dub those uh, like portals. Mm. It's like a portal. And so as you go out and in this, you know, what is it, protocol of signals, we look for you know, the types of portals that are showing up and how often and how many. And then we talk to the people and what was your experience like? And so we have qualitative measures that go along with that. And we learn quite a bit that way. So you use an audio technology to support this process. Can you give us a, you know, kind of a brief description sure. about what it is and how it works? Sure. Um, we use a lot of techniques. Originally, Bob Monroe started with binaural beats. That's where one tone goes in one ear and a tone that's slightly different. Like say 100 hertz, you measure frequencies in hertz. 100 hertz, solid tone. 104 hertz, another solid tone. 
And then when you play those, like through headphones where they're separated, your brain will try to balance the two and it, you get the difference of four hertz of a beat you will hear. And you'll hear it. it it'll go wow, 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 four times a second. Well, that stimulates your brain at four hertz, which is a delta frequency, which is a very deep relaxation frequency that we're in training and you know helping the brain move towards. And so um, that's the original technology that Bob Monroe designed. It's very effective and we still use it. Yeah, and then you mentioned uh, gamma synchrony. Mm -hmm. it's, it's got a cool name, what does it do? Yeah, well, gamma synchrony comes from another technology that we've developed where um, instead of two separate tones, we use a single tone that we can modulate using phase modulation. And what phase modulation does is it presents a different part of the signal that's coming, that single tone, to this ear and a different part to this ear. It's kind of how if I got up and walked over there, if you closed your eyes and I walked over there and said, hi, Scott, you could point right to me with your eyes closed because the tones are hitting your ears at different times. Mm. So we create a, a moving process where it's like if someone was holding a single speaker and moving it in an arc back and forth in front of you and it goes wow, wow, wow. So we can entrain from an external perspective, whereas the hemisync entrains from an internal perspective. And because it's only one tone moving, that single tone can be a musical note. And maybe we'll have four, three tones moving that could be a musical chord. So if we add these entrainment signals that are helping your meditation to music, which we all enjoy, peaceful, you know, nice music or energetic music, then we can blend that harmonically and it's not a distraction and it, the signals can be quite powerfully added. And everybody likes to listen to music when, you know, they want to relax or, or, or you know, just calm down or, or do a, an, a, a kind of a search or a journey or a quest or, or whatever they're, they're wanting to do with their meditation. Um, then we use a lot of other little tricks, but those are the two main things that we use, the internal hemisync and the external phase modulation. And so the, um, this phase modulation is able to create very high frequencies in the range of gamma, which goes up to 100 hertz, and even lambda, which goes above it. And because of the single tone moving, we can do a lot more than as far as high frequencies than with the binaural beats. With binaural beats, when you get that separation of the tones, 100, 104, if you did 100 and 140, you would then just begin to hear two separate tones. The, the binaural beat starts to stop. So gamma synchrony is difficult. Gamma synchrony is important because every part of your brain will, will have that gamma, uh, a brainwave pattern in it. And so if we can synchronize that, we end up synchronizing the whole brain in a whole brain state in a very balanced way. If you can imagine all the different areas of your brain, you know, if you look in neuroscience, there's quite a few different areas. There's some major ones and then a lot of little ones. And if you imagine that the operation of this area, you know, imagine it as a jump rope swinging, you know, it's working, it's working, it's working. And this area over here is working, but it's working at a little different pace. It's not keeping up, who knows what. Um, and so you have all that. When you get into a state of gamma synchrony, all of the jump ropes are in unison. And so your brain is in its highest. And again, your brain is, an, is a connector or an antenna to your infinite consciousness. And so you know your consciousness maybe doesn't exist inside here. So if you perfect this antenna, then boom, you know, a lot more awareness and conscious expansion opens up for you. So this is part of the discovery program and, and you created this um, to help you do research mm -hmm. as director of innovation for Monroe Institute. Um, what is that? What else do you do as the director of innovation? What is that? What, right. what does that mean? Well, part of it is to be involved with, I'm involved with a lot of different aspects and we have a great team there um, and we all work together and support each other. So, you know, yeah, we have our individual jobs, but they're all really, you know, I couldn't do what I do by myself. I, you know, we work as a team and that's how the Monroe Institute 
moves forward. But my job is to work on new, um, new ways to express what we know and to support getting our, our knowledge and our experience to as many people as possible. Because, mm -hmm. you know, we're kind of small back in the Blue Ridge Mountains and um, we can only house so many people at a time. But if we reach out into the world in, in other ways and, and share the knowledge that we have in a, in a way that's acceptable, that's interesting, that's available to, you know, people on the scale of millions instead of hundreds or thousands, um, I think we, we do a great service to mankind. And so I just finished a program last week where we invited musical artists from coast to coast in the U.S., some from Europe, um, uh, and uh, some. there was a, a very good videographer, some uh, visual artists, and we had a creation program where we used the Gamma Synchrony to support creation and help you know creators move through blockages, move to the place of inspiration. And so we had on-site creation and the goal there was to be able to create imagery, sound, that now I'm creating the signals and the sound and the imagery that goes with it all together instead of in like a linear fashion where we get some music for someone and add signals. That works very well. But what if, what level could we go to if we created the music for the signals and the signals for the sound and the two, you know, came together as, you know, one creation? And we had some really great success this last week. So that's the kind of things that I do. Um, you mentioned that the Monroe Institute is reaching out in other ways than residential programming. So um, I know they do programs via Zoom. Is, is that effective? Yes, it is. Um, and especially during COVID, um, we uh, were not in a position to be able to have the residential programs, which is our main support and what we had done for, for decades. And now pff, you can't do that. So we, we, we pivoted to online programs and we had to change a few things, but um, I think we did a very good job of that and we made it available and we did some marketing so that people would know about it. And a lot of people were sitting at home. They didn't have little to do. A lot of people were kind of fearful because of, you know, where's this going? What's gonna happen next? And so we were able to have, offer that, you know, that activity of, you know, expanding consciousness and exploring and having a good time. But it also gave, I think, tremendous relief that people could access that in a time when it was probably, you know, very useful and necessary for a lot of people. And yeah, it was before vaccines. That's right, that's right. There was no end in sight and no, conclusion that this would end well <laughs> and so to be able to meet with people on the little squares of a zoom was not the same as sitting in a room with people we all know that but you still could meet with people and go through that exploration together and have a, a leader lead you and have the audio exercises available and so it was a, a convenience it also brought the availability of TMI programs to people in other countries who maybe wouldn't afford a, or the time or expense to fly from Europe to Virginia, do a program and fly back. Now they could just sit at home. Now the time difference was a little, little bit of a consideration, but they did well. And so we opened our, our, um, our programs and our, and our applications to people that normally may not have even come. So, and they were very grateful for that opportunity. So we served new people and we were able to serve our, you know, present large group of, of participants. And it, it, it worked very effectively. I remember because the very first Zoom gateway that was taught, um, there were participants from six continents. Yeah, yeah. Six continents. Amazing. Yeah. And you know, if we'd known anybody down at the weather station in Antarctica, you know, <laughs> they might <laughs> give, give them a free program. Well, to, you know, we make have, it seven. There is a program with a, a couple people from Australia, and I was so impressed because this is like turning night to day for them. Mm. And uh, you know, I thought, oh, I hope they stick with it. Man, they wouldn't have missed it for the world. You know, they were <laughs> they're up at midnight. You know, we're beginning it early in the morning or whatever, and they're up in the middle of the night beginning. And, and they came every day and they were enthusiastic. And I'm sure they had a nice long nap afterwards. But um, 
But it was it was fascinating to see how it was made accessibility at a time when it was really really important. So for a long time, you did um, you added the tones to um, guided meditations. You added the tones to music. Um, so when you do that, what are the, what's your thought process? How, how you know how do you how do you get the 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 sauce to be just right. Right. Well, I've been involved with the Monroe Institute and doing, you know, my own research and, and, and uh, mixing before I actually officially worked for the Institute, you know, and I would try to make contributions and things like that. Um, it, from being a trainer for 20 some years now and, um, you know, listening to what people say when they experience an exercise and knowing what signals are there. Whatever the intent was, good, but I would listen to what people said, and I got to listen to what a lot of people said, and I was listening to them explaining their experiences, and I'm finding out these different kinds of places, I don't know if place is a good word, but experiences that had similarity, and they get called a place. I don't know if it really is a place, but it's a level of consciousness, and I'm saying that's important, and then I'm seeing what people consider to be beneficial and explain it and then certainly it is beneficial and so we were able to you know shift towards that now it's not just okay these signals are good let's listen to those for four hours maybe that doesn't work maybe that's too long and so how long and then now we're at a level where we really have what I call audio protocols where you start with these three signals and then at this point it shifts to these signals and we move you through a soundscape mm -hmm. of, of effects, maybe music, maybe verbal guidance. And so the signals, depending on the intent or purpose of the exercise, will shift to facilitate that experience for people. So the the context of the meditation drives what signals they absolutely do, they yes. pick yes and and then the feedback loop is that you listen to what people say to see if it really really mm -hmm. worked that's right like you and, and, it, and for, from my perspective i've seen you know hundreds of eegs and it's interesting and there's information that's valuable but for me meditation is experience and so if I get to hear the experience, I would rather hear the experience of a thousand people than see the EEGs of a thousand people because I learn more. Okay, so if somebody picks something like out-of-body experience or something, and what you're telling me then is that um, you can look at people having the exact same experience, but their EEGs are going to be different. They aren't. That's correct. And, well, sometimes there is a general type of a trend. Now, in this discovery program I'm talking about, there have been a few times where people have had, like, I guess the best word to describe it would be an epiphany. You know, I mean, this is a mega, you know, I, I think in some of the, like in, the, in some literature, they call it a kundalini experience or something of that type of, of energy. That, that uh, unity experience. That's the, right. The oneness. That's right. Whatever. And yeah. I remember one in particular, the man was... Um, a very joyful person, very intelligent, but always fun. And, and it's not that he didn't take it serious, but he went into these meditations lightly. And so he wasn't really trying or whatever, like, okay, see what happens. And so, which is a good thing to not have a, an agenda all the time and sometimes just to let go. And he had an experience where he literally was so overwhelmed by the feeling and experience of being connected to all that is. And you could call that the universe, God, you know, we're all connected. It, total du duality totally disappeared for him, and he had never had anything like that. When it was over, he was very emotional. He literally couldn't speak. He was just so overwhelmed. He, it took him a while to compose himself, and then he, he really wants to express, you know, what happened, and the words just couldn't handle, hold it, right? Yep. So we, we think, well, this is going to be great. So he's having the experience clearly of connected to all that is, you know, the oneness, the unity. And we look at his EEG, nothing, not, the, not a thing. His whoa. heart was beating and he was breathing and it was like that. So that experience, like, and this is why I, I like to say, it didn't happen in his brain. 
but he was conscious of it. Wow, maybe your consciousness isn't limited to this. Thing. So it was like the brain just stepped aside to let the experience through. Something like that, yeah. And, and I can't comment further on, you know, I can get philosophical and, and, and all excited about it, but scientifically, you know, that says a lot that your brain can, I mean, it would be difficult for a meditator to purposefully have a brain waves thing look like that. Um, but uh, he did it without trying, it happened. And then, you know, then when he could talk, he didn't stop talking about how miraculous it was. And, and he, because he couldn't capture it, you know, in the words. And then we look at the no thing brainwave. So it's fascinating, you know, and so that's what I mean by experience teaches us so much and if you pay attention to that and look for you know commonalities or extremes or whatever we can learn so much and then we can try to you know provide the audio meditations that support i think everyone would enjoy that experience if we could so have you figured out a way to uh, have the brain step aside well more and more you know really i, I, I would call his experience extreme but as we do this, like I told you in the discovery program, we, we do a lot of remote viewing. We also do out of body experience with targets so that if you can name the target or in, in out of body experience, you can literally see the target. So to be able to describe it is much easier in remote viewing. You're more into the information network. Like I could describe, uh, it's, it's, it's a wooden flat thing with four legs and I'm describing a table. But then I could tell you it was made in Ecuador by a man named uh, Jose and his son uh, is a you know, carpenter that works with him. You know, I enter the network of that oh, uh, information yeah. and out of body. It's kind of like being here, like you would experience that microphone and you could talk about it and say what color it was. You wouldn't know where it was made or the model number or anything like that. So. Um, so we're able to, you know, uh, use those things to, to gather the information. Um, okay. I was going to have us switch gears a little bit. Okay. Did you finish that thought? Yeah, I think so. Okay. <laughs> the, um, I would love for you to wax philosophically a little bit okay. about um, what have you discovered about the nature of what it means to be human by doing this work for 25, 30 years? Mm -hmm. um, it comes up in a lot of workshops and we just had a, a most beautiful discussion in this last program that I've just finished uh, yesterday. Um, and it comes down to um, the realization and it usually it's not so much it happens to an individual. It seems to come from a group of individuals experiencing this together. It's almost like together we can do things that maybe none of us would do by ourselves, maybe. Um, but, but in a group experience going through this, we come to the place where it becomes, and these aren't always the words that use, but it's, it's this balance or transformation of love and fear. And I think that's what... You know, if you're fearful, you, you make poor decisions. You, um, you make actually self-destructive decisions sometimes and you feel trapped and you, you know, your, your whole world perspective is very, very different than someone who comes from a place of love. Now that's easy to say, you know, because we all become, you know, you know, oh no, it's discernment, I'm not afraid. But, 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 you know, there, it's a, it's going to happen in life. And the question is, do you have the resilience and the connection to the love that you truly are to be able to negotiate these obstacles in life? Cause they're going to come and fear in my life. And this is, again, I'm philosophical and it's my opinion. I look at fear as a golden opportunity. I'm going to learn something new. Mm -hmm. Now I might learn this hurts really bad, but, <laughs> but, and, I, and I'm kidding, but, but fear for me is an opportunity. And I think that comes from, you know, a lifetime of, I've had a very supportive family, great relationships. Um, I love working at the Monroe Institute. I meet amazing people every time I'm here. Um, I'm a very fortunate person and I can usually almost always come from a place of love and I have a resilience to maintain that that, you know, it's very difficult for me to become fearful. I reckon I can say, well, that would be a fearful situation, but 
you know, it's that easy to, to not disregard it, but to, to negotiate it. You know, and sometimes we take our lumps and, and then you, but then you can get up and move on. You know? So uh, kind of rewording that a little bit, um, fearful situations are, um, it's like the universe saying to us, Hey, there is something that you need to learn. This is this is a wake up call. Exactly. And that if you can be together enough to switch and come from a place of love or at least a place of curiosity. Mm -hmm. Like what is it this is you're trying to teach me here? Right. Well, and it's it, and maybe this is a male thing, but you know, in a group, oh no, I'm not afraid. You know, but I'm saying, you know, you, you want to disregard fear and, and no, no. And, and it's an un, unacceptable thing. And so things that need to be dealt with get pushed, pushed away and they tend to, you know, add up. And then you've got, you know, an issue that real. if you don't deal with it, it's going to deal with you. And so, you know, there's a much easier way to proceed through life that way and um and i'll use you know i hope i don't offend anyone but you know if you look at any news program why do they focus on all the bad things that are happening what if news focused on the very best things that happened in the world today no because people want to hear about what's what should i be afraid of so i can survive and not you know grapefruits may be killing you tune in at 11. <gasps> You know, and then you tune in and it's a big hoax, you know, and they're, they're just luring you in with some silliness. But um, fear is, is something that's manipulated often. And uh, so, you, so you have to be on guard and, and build that resilience. And uh, I think the Monroe Institute programs are exceptionally good at helping that. So what about um, the, what's the nature of this non-physical universe that we expand into in these expanded states mm -hmm. of awareness? Well, I think it's, um, I think we have access to it and always have. I don't think you come to the Monroe Institute and we plug you into infinity, right? <laughs> right? right? I mean, it's where you came from, it's where you are, it's where you're going, it's who you are. And, and infinity's hard to understand sometimes because it doesn't happen at the grocery store or, or you know, driving your car. And so, um, to you know stop your life come to a meditative you know practice and and experience that expansion of consciousness and you go wow and then you expand it more and go wow and then when someone tells you oh it never stops you know it's not like you wake up oh i did four minute pro programs and now i'm enlightened i've got it there it doesn't happen it your your expansion into infinity continues and continues and continues and maybe when we transition and some you know you you work in the non-death or near-death experience non-death <laughs> near-death experience it, that's true too <laughs> that's the one we'd like yeah well you're right non-death exactly um but you know that is you know that transition of awareness and experience from you know duality to unity to the drop of water, to the ocean, to the, and it, and, and people worry, you know, well, if the drop's gone, does that mean I'm gone? And, you know, well, let's face it, death is traumatic. I mean, it's a difficult thing because when I know someone who dies, they're gone. I don't, you know, I can't shake their hand. I can't give them a hug. I can't have a meal with them, you know, but there's a presence, right? Mm -hmm. That never leaves. So they're not gone, gone, but what does that mean? And that's a good thing to explore and try to understand. So I think that um, that we're right on track with that, the, the programs that we have to help people negotiate that, you know, we're more than our physical body, as Bob Monroe said so often, we're more than our physical body. And when I die, I might very well continue to be more. And then we have these other programs, Lifeline, Near Death Experience, where we can pretty much validate that there's definitely more than this physical world. So when we go and we expand ourselves, then we expand ourselves again, you know, when we, this continual program of growth that um, Monroe Programs instigates, um, do you need the technology to help you keep doing this well 
That's an interesting question. And since I'm a, an audio engineer who creates those exercises, I should say, absolutely, without it, you will fail. But it's not <laughs> the case at all. The, and Bob Monroe himself, in the, from day one, 50 plus years ago, he created this as a way for you to explore and expand and make that shift in awareness. It's like once you know from your experience, not books and movies, but from your experience, that there is more than the physical body. There is an infinite consciousness that I am, that I was before I was physical, that I still am now, and that I will be after I leave this physical um, experience. So when you know that through your experience, no one can take that away from you. It's, it's who you are. And we can help that, you know, awareness happen with using, you know, the, the tools. America is not exactly a very, uh, you know, meditative culture. If you go to the, you know, Tibetan monks from the time they're a child till they're, in, you know, in their 80s, they've meditated six hours a day at least. You know, and it's like, I can't imagine the perspective they must have from that. I would sure like to know. But we can help people elevate that expansion in a similar way using technology. And then once you get to a place, it's almost like your natural awareness then kicks in as you start to remember where you came from and where you really are. And, uh, and then understanding where you're going. And when that happens, no, you don't need anything. In fact, I would say you will probably prefer absolute silence over you know, support. Bob and Roe called the signals training wheels, like when you were a kid and you learned to ride your bike. Yeah. You, you weren't 18 years old and you go, well, keep them on just in case. You didn't, that was it, training wheels no more. So, um, and in his initial gateway program that started, you know, all those years ago, there's actually an exercise as you're getting into the program that he calls the non-tape, it used to be tapes, the non-signal experience where you go in with some signals and then they turn you into absolute silence and you have your experience with no support. And within just a few days, people can do that. So. Cool. Mm. So you mentioned about um, our transition and that we, that those people are close to us, that we can feel their presence and we can, um, so um, the role of, deceased friends and relatives, the role of guidance, the role of divine beings. This is all within the, the realm of expanded states of awareness. That's right. Absolutely. And, and much more, a, a lot of those things are not just, you know, mystical experiences and adventures to be had, which clearly it is, but it's much more because the, the, the knowing and the confidence and the experience that you have is directly able to be applied into your life. And, and people will ask me after training, you know, hundreds of programs, Bob, what's your favorite focus level or your favorite frequency? And I'll say this right here, awake and alert, because as I go out, I like to be awake and alert. But as I go out into all these, you know, expanded awareness adventures, when I come back to here, that expansion still remains within this awareness. And so this awareness takes on a whole new beauty and I'm more present with it and life becomes quite a bit more exciting and enjoyable, I would say. Yeah. You've talked to me about the role of intention when doing these um, exercises. Uh, fill us in. Well, um, the, the exercises are like, are like an open portal to go. Um, so if, if I say, if I take you to the world's biggest supermarket and say go buy something okay well you go in and you have like all these op well, what are you going to do you'll walk out with nothing because you don't what, what what does he want me to buy there's just too many choices and you're not quite sure what's happening and and so it, it's not very successful but if you say we're going to have a barbecue tonight and i really like pork well you might come out with some ribs you know so it, and then maybe that's a kind of silly, simple example, but that's it. When you go into an open meditation where you expand, you have to initiate with purpose and intent and um, something that will ask for it. You have to have a dream for a dream to come true. You have to ask a question to get an answer. You don't just show up and they bestow the great wisdom of all that is upon you. 
um, you already have it, you're just not aware. But um, you can go in there then and within that all that you have, answer questions and things that are important or that you can apply to your life. So what you put in determines what you get out. Cool. And so you go through the portal, intention, you turn right, left, up, down. Right. And well, and I will tell you something else that I, and I like to do and not doesn't happen all the time, but when it seems right and people are really having good success with setting an intention, going into expanded awareness, and that's happening. But you can do it the other way as well. You can go into expanded awareness and set an intention for here from that vast expanded awareness where you're connected to much more of your infinite consciousness, and then you can set that intention for here. And so it, it can work both ways. And um, it's, it's very rich. I mean, it's amazing what, you know, you can get so easily. And it never occurred to you to try that. You know, I'm just simply trying, you know, you get what you ask for. Wow, that's really nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, is this whole process safe? And yeah. how, do, how do we make it, or how do you allay people's fears? Right. Yes, it's safe. Um, at the Institute, you know, we're very careful because we don't want to cause trouble for people and, and we have an application that's filled out. And if people have certain, you know, are seeing a psychiatrist and they have a certain, you know, um, label or disorder or something, we don't want the experience of being in a group or the experience of expanding aware, awareness with periodic audio stimulation. Um, we don't want that to interfere with some, you know, problem they might have a disease or a you know a psychological disorder um, but I will tell you this um, that doesn't necessarily mean that we can't help that because clearly some people don't answer their applications completely honestly and I can tell you that I've seen amazing things there was a, a woman who came and on the fourth day she had a full-blown seizure right in our conference room and it was a pretty powerful one and so I was able to support her so she didn't injure herself kind of freaked out the group they weren't expecting that so the other trainer took them away and I sat with her and she was embarrassed when you know when she recovered she was embarrassed and I was trying to help her up and I can't get up well she clearly couldn't she was still stumbling but she didn't want to be there you know in that space so we got her up we got some water we sat for a bit and she was able to rejoin the group who was in another building doing a presentation there. Well, I had to tell that to the program director that you know, we had this seizure. While she can't continue, the signals might be causing the seizures and we don't want to uh, you know, exacerbate a condition she obviously has. Okay, so I had to go tell her that. And she broke down in tears. She just did not want to leave. And I said, well, the signals might be causing you problems because of a condition that you have, and we don't want to cause you to have another seizure. And she goes, are you kidding me? I usually have two seizures a day. Since I've been here in four days, I've had one. I need this. Oh, so we never thought of that. So I told the program director, who was an excellent person and a reasonable person, and she said, okay, she can stay. And she didn't have another seizure and we gave her some things to take home with her and her condition improved dramatically. So we're not doctors. We don't do medicine. We don't do therapy. But, you know, we also don't try to prejudge, but we certainly want to be fair to people so they understand what they're getting into. And when we enter into the non-physical space, um, I know that the affirmation is used as a way to keep us safe. Talk about that. Well, yeah, you can, again, an affirmation is, is a very um, good way to set an intention. And when people first come, especially um, like to Gateway, you say, well, have an intention. And they're like, well, what should I have? You know, they, they've never done this before. So we try to help them and we give them an affirmation. And, and, and there's different parts to it. And then we tell them they can then craft their own. And it can change, you know, with every exercise you go into. But basically, you want to say that you're more you acknowledged to yourself before you begin. I am more than my physical body. I'm an immense consciousness. I'm an infinite consciousness. I'm more than my physical body. And then you can do this. You want help. You know, from guidance, from the universe, from God, whatever your perspective, whatever you want to call it. But you want help from a higher, 
you know, source, and you're willing to accept that. And then, you know, that you have uh, the ability to, uh, the, the information will come in a way that you can understand and mm. make useful. And so you say that, and so be it, that will guide your experience. Um, I worked once in an addiction clinic with people that were in difficult, difficult situation, and they were going to do use the, the the meditations that I was making to help them relax and and also help their you know in core in collaboration with their other therapies they were going through and the you know addiction process. Um, they don't know how to set an intention, and they really don't want to hear a lecture about it because they're pretty tense. So I would literally put people in a zero gravity chair, give them a blanket. I literally put the headphones on and I said, I'm going to listen with you. And I said, I'm going to turn off this light. I'm going to play some music with some signals. And if you fall asleep, it's okay. You can't do this wrong. And then I would help set their intention. Excuse me. <coughs> I would say, when this is over, you're going to feel a lot better. And they would do maybe a 30 or 40 minute meditation with some very relaxing signals. They haven't been relaxed in a long time. They wake up and the first thing they think is, I do feel better. And at the clinic I was at then, I saw over 2,000 patients. The requirement was that each patient that came into the clinic had to see me one time. And I wasn't a therapist, I was the meditation instructor. Okay, so I can't know their his medical history, their addiction, nothing. They're just, a, I know their name. And so they had to come and see me one time if they didn't like it, they didn't have to come back. Now, none of these people had heard of the Monroe Institute, had done audio meditation. I never met one that had done an audio meditation. I know there's a lot out there, but this wasn't that crowd. And so um, of the 2,000 plus people I saw, every single person returned, even though they didn't have to. Nice work. Well, it wasn't just me. It was that that was helping them tremendously. And then I could give, in those days, it was a CD. I could say, here, you can go home and practice. Now they could get on board with their recovery by doing something for themselves that wasn't a pill or a, you know, I'm Bob, I'm an alcoholic and I'm a loser and here's what I did wrong, which is all helpful and I'm not making fun of that. But when you add that, something they can do for themselves, all of that becomes much easier because then they have confidence that they have some control. Yeah. yeah, and they feel better. And that's they successful. That. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it worked nice. well. The Monroe Institute and audio technology has really changed in the last 50 years. It started out wonderful and now it's more wonderful. Yeah. Where's it going to go from here? Um, well, we're growing. Um, we have uh, uh, people starting centers in other countries. We have an outreach program where people can take a certain training from us and can do like weekend programs in their hometown and bring it to people who maybe would not travel to the Monroe mm -hmm. students spend the money of travel and taking a whole week off of work or whatever. And we're ra rather successful with that. Those are all around the world. I've actually been involved in translating our Monroe exercises for these outreach programs into about 11 different languages. And so, um, and some of those are, you know, French, Spanish, German, language, Portuguese, languages that kind of have a wide reach. Um, and uh, so we're able to reach more people. Yeah. And I know we're real hit on like Romanian. Oh yeah, big in Romania. I've, I've translated in Lithuania, Poland. Um, I've done some exercises, not whole programs in Russian. Um, and I almost did some in China, but the Chinese government wasn't happy with these kinds of things coming into their country. <laughs> so it was stopped. Um, but uh, yeah, and then of course all the English speaking countries, it's, it's, it's in all, all of those. Um, and how about technology wise? Where would you like to see it go? Um, well, again, th this collaboration we're in now with, you know, creating music and signals and, you know, getting more artistry and, um, you know, more accessible types of, of pr presentations, you know, and variety. You know, everybody doesn't like the same thing. If I put it on a piece of music that you don't care for, then that meditation is not going to serve you well. So, um, you know, some people, I mean, I've done, I've done meditations for hip hop festival. 
I've done meditations. No. Oh, well, I, I'm well, having a hard time with that one. Yeah, no, no, no. Hip hop meditation. It worked well. They have something called lo fi, which is actually kind of oh. nice and not, you know, but I've done it with that kind of music too. But they really appreciate it. And, and it was a big hit. And you look at it not so much as in consciousness going into deeper or higher levels, you look at it as balancing energy. Oh, sure. That's so a if, great way to well, think about it. Well, if you look it. at your, your, if you're suffering from stress or PTSD, your, your stress, you know, your nervous system, sympathetic, parasympathetic, autonomic nervous system, you know, the stress things go up. Well, instead of lowering it because it's constant every day, you have to raise your relax system, hormones, neurotransmitters, whatever. And then you get more stress and you raise this and this. And now you're operating at this high level of, go for it and relax for it. And it's like, I, I equate it to driving your car down the road. And you're at the same speed as everyone else. It looks normal, feels normal, except your foot is all the way on the gas and all the way on the brake. And your car's smoking, how long is it gonna last? Yeah. Right? So what if we had a way to take that energy and do this? And so, yeah, I can put signals on a rock and roll album that will do this, where you really engage the music and instead of, ah, it's like, mm, and you fall into this energetic pattern that's really beneficial. So there's ways to accommodate different types of music. And by working with different kinds of artists, I can come up with new ways to present signals. It's like a challenge. And then everybody's genre of music can be part of it. And everybody's culture, you know, where you live, your country, your language, none of that will be a barrier. And so we work on making it accessible and easy, you know, and it's always beneficial if we can just get it to the people. Yeah. So what haven't I asked you that you would like to share with folks? Hmm. Well, I, I would go back to, which is, I probably didn't talk about it enough. I got kind of stuck on the creation, creativity part, um, the, the innovation. Um, I'm working with so many different areas in, you know, of researching potential and like virtual reality. What if we added visual to this awesome auditory experience and we could, you know, bring people to, you know, you can go and, I mean, there are, there are places on the planet, you know, sacred places, um, places of very high energy and history where they have live, you know, you can access them on the internet, virtual reality cameras. So you pop on your headset and you go to the pyramids or I don't, I'm not sure. I'm just saying now, I'm not sure these sites actually have these, um, but there are many that do. But like you could do a meditation. Stonehenge, Machu right. Picchu, whatever. You could be yeah. looking in high resolution, real time, 3D, looking anywhere you want at Stonehenge or Machu Picchu or whatever. And I think that's attractive to people. Is it necessary? No, but I think it brings a, a sacredness and an appreciation. And if you're gonna see something visual, I think those are good things to see that this tradition that we have here with the electronics and technology is very old, very old. I mean, there are instruments that go date back thousands of years that produce binaural beats. There are caves, and I'm really getting into this archeoacoustics tremendously. There are caves that are ancient and you'll see this like red ochre spot in one part of the cave that's, why is that? And you stand there and you, oh, into the cave and it echoes for like 30 seconds straight. If you move over here 10 feet, oh, nothing. nothing. And so that was important, that boom, 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 boom. And maybe that's where the shaman went to see the answers or talk to the ancestors or whatever. But I mean, this type of work is part of our our culture, our heritage, our humanness. I think we we require it, and um, and it's it's the use of it is just unlimited. So it's not that we're doing something new; we're doing it in a new way. And so I'm still looking for more new ways that are you know adaptable and applicable and make it easier for people to to get involved with it. Yeah. So if somebody wants to get a hold of you, um, what's the best way? Call Scott Taylor. No, <laughs> no I'm kidding. Um, uh, I would say to make contact with the Monroe Institute. And if you have a particular um, 
you know, question or request, you know, that's specifically designed for something that I could answer, they will send it. Um, when, when questions come into the Institute, they will send it to the appropriate department for answer, or can someone help me with this answer? And it will come to me and I'll be more than happy to, to answer questions or, you know, um, direct you to some information or whatever I can do. Yeah. So there's a, a contact page on the Monroe website. Yes. MonroeInstitute.org. MonroeInstitute.org. Bob, it's been a, a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Really. It's pleasurable. <laughs> this has been fun. Thank, Thank you. Fun. And all of you stick around because we've got some more things that could use a little bit more explanation from the lens of the afterlife files. Wow, <laughs> didn't we get a cool look inside the secret sauce that is the Monroe Institute? Let's take a look at a couple of interesting things Bob said. Just to be clear, these are my viewpoints, but that's why you watch the afterlife files to gain perspective by using more than one lens with which to view this rich information. We've talked in previous episodes about how consciousness does not reside within the human brain, but rather in our non-physical body. The model I now like to use describes the brain as filtering all the information provided by the universe into just what is required to live in the physical world. Otherwise, all that information would be overwhelming. Bob uses a slightly different metaphor. He describes meditations using audio technology like binaural beats and gamma synchrony as entering into expanded states of consciousness, thereby developing an antenna for these states of awareness. Once developed, it is always available for us to use. The second is the use of fear. The universe is clue to us that there is something to learn. What I liked about Bob's message was that our job is to develop a resilience to fear. In that way, we can be more immune to messages of fear that are designed to manipulate us. Lastly, he had a great quote about learning to meditate using audio technology to enter into and hold expanded states of consciousness. He said, and I quote, people will ask me after training hundreds of programs, Bob, what's your favorite focus level or your favorite frequency? It's right here, awake and alert. I like to be awake and alert. As I go out into all these expanded awareness adventures, when I come back to here, that expansion still remains in this awareness. And so this awareness takes on a whole new beauty and I'm more present with it. Life becomes quite a bit more exciting and enjoyable. Thank you, Bob, for describing what we do here at the Expanded Awareness Institute, the host of the Afterlife Files. I hope that videos such as this can give you some insight on what near-death and shared death experiences discover about the afterlife, the nature of consciousness, and how to live your life more fully. If you are not already a subscriber, hit that subscribe button and I would encourage you to do so. In addition, I have six albums that you can use to start explorations on your own. If you are ready to jump all in, the best way to experience the other side is participate in our five and a half day retreat. This retreat has two live trainers, 25 exercises into the non-physical universe, and the distinct advantage of support group energy and intention. I would encourage you to go down below and look at the links associated with the NDE retreat. These links will take you to information on the different elements of the course and the skill set you'll learn. This course uses binaural beats and gamma ray synchrony so you can attain and sustain expanded states of consciousness easily and safely. That means this course is perfect for both adept meditators and newbies. All will benefit. Please pay us a visit at neardeathmeditations.com. Bye now. See you next time. Thanks for joining us.